Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me uh, to welcome you on the occasion of this Brexit webinar organized by the Belgian Foreign Trade Agency in close cooperation with its federal and regional partners, the Federal Public Service Foreign Affairs, Flanders Investment and Trade, Alex and Hub Brussels. We are very pleased to welcome you so numerous for this event. We have no less than 383 participants today. Let me first of all bid a warm welcome to our Prime Minister, uh, Alexander de Croo, who honors us with his participation today and will make the introdu introductory speech in a few moments. We also welcome and thank our other guest speakers of the day. Today's webinar will be dedicated to an analysis of the bilateral trade between Belgium and the UK in the first quarter of 2021, thereby measuring the initial impact of Brexit. The UK is a major trading partner of Belgium. In 2020, it ranked as Belgium's fourth largest export market for goods and was our first client outside the EU. The UK was also Belgium's eighth largest supplier. It is therefore crucial to keep monitoring the bilateral trade developments so that the necessary actions can be taken in due course. There have been, as you know, many contradictory theories or speculations as to the impact of Brexit on trade between the EU and the UK. In early 2021, the British and European press reported rather discrepant stories, while the Calais port authorities observed a decline of 75% in goods being shipped to the UK, their colleagues in Dover stated that import and export of goods between the UK and the EU were holding at 75% of pre-Brexit numbers. Such a difference obviously is a source of confusion. Today, we hope that with this webinar, we will be able to bring some clarity on the impact of Brexit for Belgium, bearing in mind, of course, that other factors such as the COVID crisis also played a role on trade contraction. The reference period will also be important to consider. One must, for instance, take into account that during the last quarter of 2020, Brexit fears probably caused increased last minute trade activity, leading to possible distortions in figures. We are very grateful to our colleagues of the Federal Public Services, Economy and Finances, mm -hmm. Customs and Excises Administration for their support in the build up to this uh, webinar. Today, Jeroen Sarazen, Brexit coordinator at Belgian Customs, will share with us his analysis of the situation and the experiences in the field. Which sectors were hit most? How can Belgian exporters to the UK adapt? And which issues need to be tackled first? Next, we will focus on two sectors that were clearly affected by Brexit, namely the food sector and the transport and logistics sectors. Mr. Barbas, uh, CEO of Fevia, was supposed to take the floor today, but um, has uh, an emergency at home, and we will be replaced by his colleague, uh, Tien van der Velde. Next, we'll have Mrs. Marie Desrousseau, policy advisor of Fevetra, who will share with us uh, also relevant facts of her federation. Finally, Wart Wienert, Brexit expert at the International Department of Commerce of the Federal Public Service Economy, will report on the current political negotiations and future perspectives. After the speeches, there will be an opportunity to ask uh, questions to our speakers and do not hesitate to make use of uh, the chat as well. But let me now introduce our guest of honor, uh, the Belgian Prime Minister, His Excellency Alexander de Croo. We are very grateful, Your Excellency, that you could spare us some time to join us today, uh, in spite of a busy agenda dominated by the COVID crisis. I believe I expressed the general opinion of our par participants here by conveying our respect for the way you handle this extremely difficult uh, crisis and period in our history. We really wish to wish you success in the coming weeks and months in your endeavors to master the crisis and lead Belgian economy on the way to a recovery. Our agency together with its federal and regional partners will certainly do its utmost to also contribute to the re recovery by way of the trade missions that hopefully we will be able to start uh, in autumn this year, one to the UK in September and one to the United States uh, planned for October. I will uh, now gladly give, give you the floor, Your Excellency, to share your views on this important uh, 
Brexit talk. Thank you beforehand. Thank you for the uh, for the kind uh, kind introduction and um, and thank you for wishing wishing me luck, but I would say wishing uh, wishing us luck because I think this um, mastering this COVID crisis really is a is a collective effort and and I think if over the last months we have been able to. Um, uh, to, to manage the fact that there is no exponential growth of COVID anymore in our country. Um, it, it's thanks to the fact that um, everyone understood that, that all of us have a role to play in it. And, um, and also that we have been able to find uh, good cooperation between the public sector, the private sector, academia, and, and so on. And, and I would hope that um, when we make the analysis of, of um, what went wrong and what went well uh, in the COVID period that we also focus on the things that, um, that we actually discovered and that helped us. And, and that type of cooperation, public-private, um, for me is one of the, one of the, calling it success stories is maybe, uh, maybe a bit too ambitious, um, but it's one of the things that we should retain. And, and, and if we see the, the, the incredibly rapid development of vaccines, it has happened because the private sector and the public sector have decided to bring at the table what they're best at. And, and we can do incredible things if, if all of us bring what we're best at at the, uh, at the table. But let's talk about, um, about Brexit, um, a topic that, um, yes, I have followed from, uh, fr from nearby because as a, as a finance minister before, obviously uh, there was a lot of preparation which um, we were uh, we were part of, and, and I've heard that um, someone from the Belgian Customs is uh, is, uh, is is taking the floor as well um, later in this uh, in this seminar. And I'd have to say that on on that side, a tremendous effort has been uh, has been done. A lot of preparation work has been uh, has been done, and 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 I think. But let's hear to what the the participants want to say. I think that um, on the Belgian side, we were quite prepared. Um, to, to, to handle the friction that, that Brexit is, um, is, uh, is bringing. I think it is the right moment to do an analysis now um, because it, it's good to take stock early on and, and to understand early on what the impact uh, is and, and how we need to change to a, new, uh, to a new reality because it is a new reality from another side there is a certain reality which will not change. The, the, the United Kingdom is a neighbor, is geographically a neighbor. That is not going to change. And the United Kingdom is physically not going to move uh, compared, to, uh, compared to Belgium. Um, in their view of the world, up to now, we could say that, yes, the United Kingdom is taking a bit distance from, uh, from the European uh, mainland. The whole question is, is that going to be something which is sustained in the future or is that a short-term effect which, which maybe rather has political motives than, uh, than other motives? Now, taking stock now of, um, of the impact of Brexit, of course, is, is good, but it's also a bit difficult. If you want to look at the statistics, um, the impact of COVID is, 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 is obviously something which is hard to filter um, out of the, uh, out of the, 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 the statistics. Um, we also know that end of 2020, there's been quite some amount of stockpiling that has happened on, on both sides of the, uh, of the trade. So, so that needs to be, uh, to be flattened out. And, and then there's the impact of the um, import and export of vaccines, obviously. Um, but maybe we should limit that to export of vaccines. Huh? Because if you look at the trade balance, I mean, the trade balance is um, almost, it's almost a one-way street. And, and, and especially on the Belgian side, um, we have exported um, huge amounts of, uh, of vaccines to the rest of the world. And, and, and I think that is a good thing on the Belgian side. We have always been very reluctant to talk about export bans and, uh, and so on, because we think that value chains need to function. And it is to the benefit of everyone that especially a global value chain such as vaccine production would be, um, would be sustained. Um, but up to now, it's really, it really has been a one-way street um, if you look at the flow of, um, of, uh, of, of, uh, of vaccines. Now, overall, I have no doubt that, that, that Brexit will have a negative impact and the negative impact will be on, uh, will be on both sides. That's unfortunate. We were definitely 
definitely not um, asking for this, but of course we have to respect the decision that has been taken on the uh, on the UK uh, on the UK side. Um, maybe also focus a bit on the geopolitical um, element, um, and I would like to put two uh, forward that are important uh, for us as as um, as members of the European Union. First of all, Northern Ireland. Uh, what we see happening in Northern Ireland are, are images that some of us uh, remember. I remember those images, but that was when I was actually still quite young. Um, but our parents and, 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 and some of us here obviously see images that we thought had been gone for more than, uh, more than, uh, more than 30 years. Um, I think that instability in Northern Ireland is, is, is not a good thing. Uh, it's not a good thing because violence never is a good thing. Um, it's not a good thing because geopolitical instability is not good uh, for prosperity. It's not good for trade, which means it's not good for job creation, and it, which means it's not good for people, uh, for people in general. Uh, but also, it could uh, impact the European Union because obviously uh, Ireland still is part of the uh, of the Union, and protecting the integrity of the single market is of prime importance for us. We've always said on the Belgian side, uh, we should not uh, create a weakness to the single market at the, uh, the border in, uh, in, uh, between Northern Ireland and, uh, and, and Ireland, um, because the impact of that uh, would be tremendously negative for everyone, not only on the Irish islands, but, but for everyone. Because for a country like Belgium, one of the biggest assets of what we achieved over the last years is that single market and is the fact that you could trust the, uh, uh, the single market. So if um, a, a weakness is sustained uh, there, it will have an impact which maybe could be bigger than the immediate impact we see of the Brexit uh, right now. That is one geopolitical element. Second geopolitical element is, um, well, referring a bit to the to the geographical, to, to the kind of the, the, the difference between geographical uh, closeness and, and political closeness that we, that we see happening uh, right now. Um, I think that in the end, uh, the United Kingdom is a close ally. And I'm convinced that in the future, uh, the United Kingdom will remain a, a, a close ally. A close ally for a number uh, for a number of reasons because of the history that we've uh, that we've had because of the so many personal ties that we uh, uh, that we uh, that we had because of the values and the principles that we uh, that we that, that we share and also because a certain type of trade with a close neighbor is just easier and and en environmentally more friendly than doing trade with, with someone who's, who's, uh, who's farther, uh, farther away. Um, I'm convinced that if the United Kingdom and Europe are a tandem, and if we are on, on, on a tandem on the same bike and pushing in the same direction, that we can, uh, we can achieve a lot of things. Um, and and uh, it is one of the priorities for, for the Belgian government is to, um, to quickly not ties again with the uh, with the with United uh, with United Kingdom, and to engage together in 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 so many challenges that we have in common, and and those challenges are on the security side, those challenges are on climate change uh, side, um, but those challenges are also uh, on the economic side and the political side, and 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 the question is. Um, for example, for the United Kingdom, who, who are your partners in this world? Uh, are, are your partners in this world China or Russia? Uh, or are they the United States and Europe? And I'm and, um, and, and, and convinced that the um, United, United Kingdom and, and Europe are partners. And it's, it might maybe take some time before everything comes to rest and when the dust settles, we will realize that we have so much in common that uh, trying to create some um, some competition between us is actually to the detriment of uh, of, of everyone. So um, if you look at what that means in uh, in practice, a few a few priorities. Obviously, in terms of trade, trying to simplify it as much as possible. 
it will never be as easy as uh, the moment when we were in the single market, obviously, but there's still a lot of things we can do to simplify this as much as possible. And I think we will all realize that this to, to, to the benefit of everyone. Uh, intensify our cooperation on the police side and on the um, on the security side, and and I don't think anyone needs to be convinced of uh, of of that. And then maybe, for example, if we look at um, our trade uh, our trade services, what are possibilities to better work together and to 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 work on the interests which we have uh, which we have aligned. I think that and and. I hope there is a lot more things we will be doing in the next months than just managing the COVID crisis on both sides of the, uh, of the, of the, of the channel. Um, but that should be on the agenda. Uh, what should be on the agenda is um, a way of working, a common agenda between uh, European Union and United Kingdom, and especially between Belgium and the United, uh, United Kingdom. And we've already uh, sent the messages to the UK government that we are open to discuss and that we would love to, um, uh, to, to engage um, on, on those, uh, those topics that I have just put, uh, put, uh, put forward and, and that from our side, a, a constructive approach can be, uh, can be expected. So um, these are the elements that I wanted to, uh, to put forward. I wish you all a, um, an, interesting, uh, an interesting webinar. I hope that at some point these kind of events, we can do them in person again but it is a little bit too early before we, uh, before we can uh, do that. But congratulate you on a very timely event and wish you um, an, interesting, uh, an interesting morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, for um, sharing uh, this interesting analysis uh, with us, including uh, very interesting geopolitical elements. Um, and let us hope that uh, there will indeed be a positive uh, evolution in our trade uh, relations with the UK and our bilateral relations in general. Uh, we'll keep looking closely at it, of course, in the coming uh, months and years. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, we expect that you're very busy. And so we'll, we'll uh, release you to uh, the rest of your agenda today. But we were honored to, to welcome you. And thank you so much again for being with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, the following um, proceedings, I will give the floor to our Deputy Director General uh, Didier Debar, uh, who will introduce the next uh, guest speakers and, and so say also uh, the conclusion. So, Didier, if you please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lewis, and thank you, Your Excellency, Mr. Prime Minister. Indeed, if anybody would have made a bet in 2015, with an English bookmaker that hashtag Brexit and hashtag COVID would be the most trending uh, on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn, um, he or she would be rich today. What we first need to know, and I think the Prime Minister uh, already uh, um, touched that subject, is what are the real empiric results, how Brexit has affected Belgian trade with the UK, and how do we have to interpret those results? And who can we better ask to guide us through that than the ones who experienced, experienced it on the front row in the field? Namely, the Federal Public Service Finances Administration, Customs and Excise. Jeroen Sarazijn of Customs will provide you with the relevant answers in as much as possible and with a, a, a due reserve that there might be some slight changes, but it will give a first final indication on where we are standing and how we have to perceive the gap that existed as uh, explained by Mrs. Lowest uh, early January between uh, the Calais and the Dover ports. With an operational and legal background, Jeroen took up the role of Brexit coordinator in the lead up to the first Brexit deadlines already uh, in 2019. With those preparations now as good as completed, Jeroen has joined economic support, the economic support team that provides solutions to operator with complicated or cross-border questions and custom procedures. He is therefore, in our opinion, the right man on the right spot to explain how we should uh, interpret the results that customs could make in this first course. Jeroen, the floor is, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, DJ. Thank you for the introduction and uh, also for the warning that it's, of course, an interpretation of figures. Uh, the truth, of course, is, uh, is, in, is in the interpretation. Uh, speaking after uh, the Prime Minister is a bit like performing after Metallica, I guess, but uh, don't go to the bar just yet. Uh, I, have, I think I have some surprising figures and, um, and, uh, and results from, uh, from Brexit. So uh, to quickly recap what, uh, what's happened, most of you will know this. Uh, up to 1st of January this year, we have been under the withdrawal agreement, uh, which means we, we, we already um, we were divorced from the UK, but we still slept together, uh, we ate together. So we had a transition period where uh, in practice nothing changed, but there was already that uh, Northern Irish uh, protocol that was already part of the withdrawal agreement and very much an, um, a legal instrument. But as um, from 1st of January, we are now in, uh, under the TCA, which means the UK is a full third country, we have, which has, of course, that trade deal with uh, the EU. That means there are no tariffs or quota, uh, some quota on, uh, on, on a limited number of products like Aluminium, aluminium, but um, but in general, no quota if you have a proof of origin. But of course, you need the customs formalities. You need to prove that uh, goods are um, are uh, originating in the EU and vice versa. And that leads, of course, to customs controls. The protocol is still very much active. Um, we touched on the geology, uh, geopolitic, uh, geopolitical uh, context of Northern Ireland but also for trades, it's, uh, it's quite uh, a strange uh, situation um, with, with the protocol. Northern Ireland uh, being, in all, for all intents and purposes, f uh, a part of the EU. Um, without, of course, doing a <laughs> an, uh, political statement with that, it's just uh, we, we apply uh, many European rules on trade with Northern Ireland. For example, there are no customs formalities between Belgium and Northern Ireland. Uh, quickly, a recap of the, um, of the um, preparations we made. And um, yeah, the, the major points of impact, of course, are uh, uh, the port of Seabrugge, where half of traffic is UK bound. Uh, and another one that has very much impacted this uh, train station in Brussels South, Brussels Midi, uh, which is, of course, an, a new border station uh, where you can enter and exit the EU. Um, it's very quiet at this moment due to uh, other circumstances than Brexit, but after the pandemic, of course, this will be uh, one of the major points of entry in the EU. Um, if we look at the first figure, uh, we, have, we had uh, 386 new customs officers, which have been recruited. Uh, in December last year, we had the last of these new officers that came in. Um, but of course, as we have a, uh, a natural um, uh, outflux of, uh, of officers, the net result is unfortunately not um, compared to the, the 2018, we don't have net uh, uh, 386 uh, extra officers, but having a bit net extra compared to pre-Brexit is still an, a major success in uh, a declining um, public service um, um, uh, situation. Uh, I see there are uh, already hands raised, but um, I think, uh, DJ, correct me if my wrong questions are taken after the seminar, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, yes. We will, uh, if the chat is used, that is the easiest, so that people, um, our people can direct the question immediately to the, the relevant person. Yes, that's, uh, that's fine for me. So we, uh, we do have, for any questions on the topic of questions, we have a call center, which has uh, over the quarter um, handled more than 700 calls, some of which very, very complicated and things we didn't really anticipate uh, ahead of uh, Brexit. Um, I, ha I heard a, uh, a nice saying yesterday, um, there's nothing logical about logistics, and that seems to be the case in the for Brexit as well. We've done numerous seminars, webinars, some of which uh, uh, this year, of course, as well. And we have um, very good contacts. Uh, uh, Mr. De Croo mentioned that uh, cooperation with the UK is, uh, is crucial. 
well, we do have a very pleasant working uh, relationship between the administration. So there's no animosity there. That, uh, and we, we, have, uh, we are now in the last phases of formalizing a, um, a cooperation platform. It's called BIFCOM, uh, uh, Belgian, uh, UK Industry uh, uh, Cooperation and uh, Federation. I, I don't know the, the exact uh, abbreviation as, it, as it's <laughs> so new and uh, abbreviations are often, uh, often used. But of course, we also uh, talk a lot with our other uh, EU um, um, colleagues. Uh, Netherlands, France, and other affected uh, nations, Ireland, and so on. So for uh, some other figures, an EU re uh, AOE registration is the first thing you need when you want to import and export outside the e uh, European Union. Um, and we have seen a major uh, increase in the Belgian uh, regis registrations since 2016. The first wave can be attributed to both uh, Brexit, but also because um, the um, obligation on import uh, was also in 2017. So the first real wave of, uh, of registrations is, has, has to do with boats. Uh, but the 2019 surge in the registrations has a lot to do with our own uh, EO reactions, where we sent letters to companies, we, 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 we spammed them, uh, let's be honest. Uh, and that resulted in uh, 7,000 new uh, direct EORI numbers. Uh, so you see, EORI started in 2019, and uh, there are, is a major increase in the last five years, some of which also uh, in 2021. Um, so companies that were uh, even, uh, um, even now not uh, registered uh, did not prepare on that, um, on that level for uh, Brexit. There were also some um, uh, EORI numbers that were not yet active. Um, an example of that is um, UK uh, corporate uh, um, enterprises that had already asked for an EORI number in Belgium the moment the UK would have left um, the, the, the Union. That Belgian number was activated so they could continue trading uh, in the EU. So um, what's the effect uh, we see on the, the, the formalities? Uh, how do companies cope with uh, those? We see that the agreements between a different party uh, must be more clear. Uh, we, we, they're, um, transporters, exporters, imports, but also shipping companies, they have to know and they have to be clearly communicate uh, among each other uh, we, who is responsible uh, for a certain document or process. Um, so that's, that's really something um, the specialists, the experts on customs um, must guide. And it's also, of course, a learning process. Uh, if, if there is a, a case uh, where a transporter thinks the client will provide something and the client thinks the transporter will provide something, that's a learning process. They will do it the second time. They will, will not make the same uh, mistake as there are some agreements that will have been uh, been made. But also uh, a bit confusing for, um, for users is that uh, the customs codes is of course the same in the, in the European Union, but the specific procedures and ports can uh, be different. A major example of that is uh, Calais Dover that is just organized differently than, uh, than Belgian ports. So in general, that's something you hear in so many uh, <laughs> Uh, companies well, and, and sectors communication is uh, is very crucial here but on the flip side generally we we have positive uh, feedback from operators about processes in uh, in belgium they tend to um, to say that belgian uh, administration and belgian sector uh, is flexible and is uh, quite efficient um, on in and uh, export but um, an example where things should be better is uh, the transit system. You can compare transit with the track and trace system. It, uh, it also works with uh, barcodes. Um, you start a transit in Belgium uh, and you can drive to a point in, um, in the UK where you end transit and you uh, declare the goods to customs, for example. Uh, and what do we see in January and February alone? 
uh, over 650 files have been started because the procedure has not been closed uh, correctly. So uh, that's a major work for customs. Uh, it's manual labor uh, and it's not sustainable. Uh, why does it happen? Uh, just a lack of knowledge and capacity, um, mainly in the UK. Um, is it fraud? No. Uh, if we if the files are uh, investigated, most of the time, the companies can show the proof that uh, the goods have actually arrived, but they ju just didn't close the procedure correctly. Uh, luckily, our UK uh, colleagues have the same, um, the same concerns and they communicate those concerns on quality of documents uh, and so on uh, to their own um, uh, companies. So we are grateful for, for that. Now, um, let's look at the fact and figures. This is the start of Brexit, uh, where you see the um, export starting a bit earlier than the uh, import. So the first days there wasn't even um, many, many crossings of the ships, uh, but that steadily increased. Um, imports increased as well. So uh, the, 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 the sector, had to had to had, was very um, uh, very careful at the start, um, but uh, we have the impression that um, that the traffic quickly uh, resumed. And then the, the major statistics and also the the, the 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 most difficult one to assess is the um, the total value of uh, of export figures. Um, we cannot compare customs data um, from this year to customs data from last year because it was still uh, the European Union. So we tried to match the figures of the, the Belgian National Bank, the, the quarter one to 2020 figures. But then of course we run in, in other difficulties. We, we have the COVID crisis. We have the first Brexit deadlines that, that, uh, that's, that uh, skew the data a bit. Uh, and we even have Northern Ireland, which is not in the customs data as there are no formalities, but they are in the national bank data. So we try to do our best. And what was the result? If we try to match the data set, we have actually an increase in, in, uh, in statist statistical value on exports. So that cannot, cannot be the right figure. It is too much in that data set. Uh, let's do it differently. Let's, uh, let's take all the data from uh, the national bank uh, and then take um, all our data. So we know this is not, this, this cannot be right either. But for example, Northern Ireland is not included uh, in this as well. So the conclusion has to be made that the truth is somewhere in between. Um, but that's also a very careful conclusion that I, that I want to make based on our figures is that there is not a dramatic decrease in uh, export. So there's no 50% there's no decrease, for example. Um, if uh, if we, we see other figures, we might, um, we might put them next to our data sets. But let's stay in the same data sets. So if we, we use only our data sets, we see both import and export very much increasing uh, since January. So January, January really was not a good month. Um, but we've seen a very rapid um, increase in import and export, more pronounced on import. Um, the figures from the UK were indeed uh, quite low. And if you look at uh, reports by the British government, which, uh, which, which reported a major decline in exports, well, we see that on the import side uh, as well. But of course, don't forget the effects of stockpiling uh, as well. What is the partition of the import and export? If we, uh, the UK is, like uh, Madame Lost says, our, um, our most important non-EU trading partner, well, we see that uh, the UK is um, responsible for half of the import decorations and um, almost uh, the a quarter of the export decorations. If we look at the value, it's less pronounced. It's, it's still a lot, of course, but it's less pronounced. 
and that is the effect of e-commerce. We have a um, major uh, international player that uses Belgium as a gateway for the rest of, uh, of, of Europe for its e-commerce from uh, the EU. So these are generally um, consignments with a low wish value. So they, they generate a lot of declarations, um, but the value side is not, um, is not that pronounced. Um, but it still has some effect. Um, if we look at the share of the sector um, and try to, to, to look at some winners and losers from the Brexit uh, uh, change, uh, let's look at some things that were um, anticipated ahead. So we, there was always the concern for agriculture, for, uh, for food stuff and so, and so on, and, uh, and textiles. But let's look at, at textiles first, a very uh, clear one to distinguish carpets. Uh, yes, they are uh, apparently down. Uh, but foodstuff in general seems to be um, stable with some winners, some losers. Uh, Tine van der Velden will, will guide you uh, through that, I guess. But then we have a major surprise on the automotive, um, which, which has really declined. Um, and the, the, the strange thing is that automotive isn't really a sector where a lot of small companies um, have, have a, lo a lot of trade. It's, 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 a, it's one of the sectors that's most used to custom formalities. And I guess that, um, that stockpiling has something to do with this uh, as well. And we, we also know there were some supply issues on uh, microchips and so on and uh, raw materials in automotive. But there's, there's, that's um, our top exporting uh, sector from uh, 2020 uh, is, is now, um, now a bit less. Um, but that's, of course, it's a product mix. And for example, fuel, very high value. Uh, if there is a cold winter, of course, a lot of fuel goes back and forth and can, um, can influence statistics as well. But there is, of course, an elephant in the room that the Prime Minister has also mentioned, where traditionally automotive is by value the, the largest contributor. Uh, we have now a new winner and uh, it's uh, a certain uh, product that is made in Belgium with, um, with a very high uh, value. If we take out that specific um, that specific product with uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, um, we see that um, other sectors are in, uh, in fact sometimes the, the, the drop is not that dramatic. Um, maybe we see um, even uh, fuels, for example, have even a greater percentage of uh, of increase. And uh, most other uh, um, uh, products aren't um, dropping that that uh, by the same amount percentage-wise. So, so really, the export of the vaccines is um, is is pulling the, the statistics a bit uh, in in, a, in strange directions. So, as a, a general. Uh, conclusions, uh, careful conclusions that we can make after this first quarter uh, is that the trade co uh, and cooperation agreement is a good thing, albeit a limited uh, help, but it does provide tariff-free trades, um, although, of course, the barrier of formalities is still there. We haven't seen Brexit chaos. Um, that's a result of the, um, of, of I, I think, the good preparation by Belgian industry, by Belgian logistics firms, and also um, the, the administration. But we see that there is a, a steep learning process for many operators, and there are still, the, the, the data needs to be better, uh, there needs to be more communication between them, which means assistance and information by specialists will be very much necessary in the, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Um, we also see that figures are very difficult uh, to assess, but something we can say for sure is that trade is recovering. 
the trade figures compared from January uh, up to March, we see a major increase. Um, uh, by, it's an increase by a third um, on, on, on export um, and on imports. It's, it's almost an increase by, by 50%. So trade very much recovering from that early January uh, start. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I guess there will be some questions in the Q&A that I will try to answer. And after the, the webinar or after my, um, of, or right now, there'll be some um, uh, oral questions as well, but I'll let our master of ceremony, DJ, the, decide on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeroen. Indeed, very interesting to see where we are standing now, at least to have a, a clear direction. It remains, as you clearly said and explained to us, quite difficult to interpret uh, some of the numbers uh, as the reference period is not always uh, easy to be made. Uh, I want to make clear that we, we made a comparison with the whole year of 2020 in order to avoid special um, uh, events that took place like complete lockdowns, which might have influenced trade as well. Um, but if we go to uh, um, outside the, U, uh, the EU and not only to Britain or even within the EU, we go abroad um, and you ask what is Belgium famous for? Uh, I guess we will uh, nearly all agree that our um, food industry uh, has a very good reputation. Belgian waffles, Belgian sprouts, uh, Belgian chocolate, Belgian beers, uh, you name it, uh, they're on top of what people uh, will name if you ask them uh, what they know about Belgium. So it was quite interesting to see that uh, from, from a number point of view, there is not a big influence uh, yet However, um, I think, and we, this is the reason why we have invited uh, Fevia, uh, it is a uh, particular sector. Um, the food sector has some uh, stallments in measures that will be applied uh, in the near future. And who better to ask that than Fevia? Fevia, uh, which represents 27 sectors in uh, food and drinks industry and more than 700 companies. And I'm gladly to give the word now to uh, Tina van der Velden, which is the international business manager at Fabia. She's responsible for the international trade, export promotion and strengthening the image of the Belgian food and drinks abroad. Um, mainly know under the name of food.be, small country, great food. And we all say amen to that. But as, as, as of uh, 2018, she also took up the role of the Brexit coordinator at Fevia. And therefore, I believe that Tina is the right person uh, that can guide us how this, uh, the food industry has experienced these first months of Brexit and what we can expect next. Tina, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Didier. And thank you for introducing Fevia and giving us the floor and committing us in this webinar. It's a very timely webinar, interesting moment to take first stock. Uh, I would like to first excuse our CEO, Bart Buys, who is unfortunately unable to attend today. Uh, but first, before discussing Brexit, let me just say in a few words a bit more about Fevia and the Belgian food industry. So uh, as you said, uh, Fevia's federation and the voice of the Belgian food industry we represent companies active in the production and processing of food and beverages and count over 700 members. Uh, both uh, larger companies uh, like IBM, Lef, Coca-Cola, Mondavis, Nestle, Unilever, but also SMEs with less than 100 employees, which are the majority actually of our members. Uh, we consist of 96% uh, SMEs. We represent 27 subsectors and branch organizations, which make us a very diverse and also a very proud sector. And here are some key figures on our sector for 2020. Uh, after a record year in 2029, sorry, 2019, 2020 is the year in which we felt the impact of COVID, of course, uh, like other sectors, uh, Phoebe, I felt this crisis as well. Uh, you can see this in these figures, which are all lower than in 2019, except in the area of employment. 
uh, but still, we have um, um, a turnover of uh, 54 billion euros, 1.7 billion in investments, and almost uh, 96,000 food heroes in our sector. Almost half of the turnover comes from exports, and we export more than we import. So this results in a positive trade balance. Export is very important for our sector. It's the motor for growth for investments and employments in the Belgian food industry. This chart you see here uh, shows the evolution of the export of Belgian food and beverages. Our export has been growing consistently over the last 10 years, which is not the case for average export figures for other goods and products, which you see in the red line. We only see a downward kink in our exports in 2020, obviously, which is, of course, a result of the COVID crisis. Hopefully, we can now quickly put a crisis behind us and get our exports back on track for growth. About 70% of our export remains in uh, Europe. Most of it goes to our neighboring countries. This map you, you see here uh, shows us the top five export destinations within Europe. As you see, the Netherlands, France, Germany, Italy, and Luxembourg. UK used to be our first, uh, fourth export destination within Europe, but because of Brexit is now a third country. There are um, the main export destinations also overseas, and now we have to include the UK there. Uh, now, of course, the UK is there on the first place, the total turnover for a sector of more than 2.1 billion euros, and it is followed by the US, China, Japan, and Canada. Now, what about trade between Belgium and the UK? It's, of course, the topic of today. Looking at the figures since 2015, we see a slight upward trend for exports within Europe and a strong increase in exports overseas, both of which are showing a downturn in 2020 due to the COVID crisis. Exports to the UK, on the other hand, has been on a downward trend since 2015 undoubtedly due to the uncertainty and lack of clarity brought about by the announcements and preparations of Brexit. Also on this chart, we clearly see the decline year after year in exports to the UK uh, after the referendum in 2016. This also implies to imports from the UK, which also partly relates to our uh, sector for the sourcing by our companies in the UK. There we see first a certain flare up, but from uh, 2018 onwards, imports are also on a downward trend. We'll have to see what 2020 will bring. We only have figures now for January 2021, so it's too early to draw conclusions. So for further figures, I think we'll have to wait uh, a couple of months before we start making big announcements and statements about the impact of Brexit. Um, what did we export in 2020? You see here an overview. You see it's very diverse, there are very diverse products. And the top five, we see beverages, uh, as uh, Didier said, Belgian beers, but also uh, waters, soft drinks. Uh, you see dairy products, cheese, yogurt, cream, milk, fruit and vegetable preparations, also our Belgian fries, meat, chicken, sausages, Belgian pâté, for example, and our cereal products, including biscuits and chocolate products as well. But actually, almost all of our subsectors are affected, as you see, because we have a direct, um, a diverse uh, group of uh, products that we export. Import is also quite diverse. You see uh, um, some changes from the, from the export side. So on the import side, you see top five uh, with dairy products, beverages, fats and oils, cereals, and vegetables. Now, what is the current impact of uh, the Brexit on the Belgian food industry, and what uh, do we expect in the near future? So this is very important. Um, Brexit will impact us in different stages. We, of course, were very happy with the Brexit deal under the Christmas tree in December. That has avoided the worst case scenario that we were all afraid of, um, namely a no deal Brexit with trade under the WTO regime with tariffs and quota. But that does not mean that there is no impact. The impact is felt more gradually in different stages. The rules have changed. The UK is now a third country and our companies have to complete custom formalities 
their rules of origin, which mean that in certain cases, terrorists apply after all. And this has an, impo an impact. Exporting and importing is more complex, time consuming and costly than before. As of October, certificates, certificates will be required for certain products. And as of January 2022, border controls in the UK side, on the UK side will become more strict. And in the long term, there is real chance that the alignment and level playing field we know today will disappear and that the UK will apply different norms and standards in areas such as environment, social aspects, labeling, food safety, et cetera. And that may give them a competitive uh, advantage. So uh, for us, we, we are now digesting the first stage of Brexit, but the next stages will come in October and January and then in March next year. We already surveyed our members twice this year, uh, this year to see what the impact is, the immediate impact, and then now uh, three months after Brexit. And let me briefly share the results with you here. If we compare both surveys, uh, surveys we see that there um, is a further decrease of exports. And you see here each, each uh, side the results of January and of the April survey, and then the question we asked. So the conclusions are that uh, there is a further de decrease of exports, more companies are impacted, and more companies expect a further major decrease of exports. So the real impact of Brexit is starting to show, but will show further in the next months and years to come. So that's a very uh, important note to take. On the other hand, there is also some positive news. Uh, less companies experience difficulties and delays, even if 60, uh, sorry, 46% uh, is still quite high, and we can only speak of a slight improvement. We also see that delays become smaller, which is, uh, well, a big uh, improvement. This is positive, so it looks that businesses are slowly starting to adapt on both sides. Uh, another important uh, note to take is, however, that more and more companies have to call on external services, such as customs, consultancy, transport, logistics, etc. In January, this was already the case for two out of three companies and now even three out of four. And of course, this has a cost for our companies. So how did our companies manage to prepare and adapt to the new situation? Well, they did in several ways, for example, by retraining their staff for new use, formalities, customs, all the tools that, we, that they will have to, need to use for that. Uh, there was also an automatization of custom declarations digitalization of the logistical processes. Uh, some of them applied for the IAO statute, a statute uh, authorized economic operator. And this also implies that they uh, had to make some adaptations on their industrial sites. Some of our members established a UK affiliate to make life a bit easier on the import sites. And there was of course reorganization of transport logistics, to pass uh, shipments, et cetera. Their main concern for the futures are the fact that for certain products, health certificates will apply as of October 2021. For certain products, they already apply, but, but this will increase on the next stages. Uh, and also, of course, the border checks that will become more strict as, as of January 2022. But also, there is the fear that UK consumers, but also buyers, will more and more choose UK products instead of Belgian products. That will be a more long-term effect. So in view of the current situation and the future, what are Fevia's priorities? Uh, of course, we continue to defend, defend the interest of the Belgian food industry in direct contact with the competent ministers and administrations. So a lot of people around the table here today and the other speakers, we have been working with them very closely uh, the last couple of years and months, uh, which we are very grateful for. Uh, we have, for example, a direct sectoral dialogue with Customs, the Federal Agency for Safety in the Food Chain, and the Federal Public Service for Economy for this purpose. And of course, we do the same at the European level in our contacts with Food Drink Europe, which is our European Federation. So we are, in fact, a point of contact for our food companies, but also for the authorities. Uh, at this moment, we are mainly trying to obtain clarifications about the health certificates and the border controls that UK authorities will apply in the coming months. 
because at the moment is still not 100% clear um, which products uh, will need which certificates, which border controls will take place and how and where the controls will take place. This should be urgently settled by means of the Border Industry Facilitation Committee with Belgian and British officials. And hopefully in this way, we can put pressure on the UK to do its homework. We're also trying to obtain a fast and flexible service from the Federal Agency for the Safety of the Food Chain. And this with the aim of being able to deliver certificates more quickly and even outside normal working hours during weekends. Uh, because we are working in a, uh, in a faster way, we need to be working in a faster way, flexible way, and hopefully more in a digital way as well. And it is important to know that our companies can already um, uh, appeal to the regional export agencies for financial support for the adjustments they have to make in connection with Brexit. Uh, in this context, we're also trying to obtain sectoral resources to guide and train our companies in this position. So the, the budgets are available. Um, uh, companies can apply for certain uh, subsidies. So I really call on them to make use of them. Uh, to keep you up to date, we would like to invite you to consult our online Brexit guide and our newsletters with updates. To get targeted information, you can simply create an account on the Favia website. So please do so to stay tuned. We also continue to train um, our members in partnership with Deloitte on all the custom formalities that must be fulfilled when training with third countries, such as the UK, through our e-learning tool, and which is aimed at the food industry and which combines theory and practice. You can find all relevant information via the links here on this slide. As indicated earlier, it will be important to prepare our companies for the next steps in the UK border operating model, for which next phases of the rollout of trade formalities are foreseen, as I said, in October this year, and then in January and March next year. And there's still a lot to be clarified, but this will, of course, have an impact on our companies as well. Meanwhile, we continue to encourage trade and cooperation between Belgium and the UK, and this is why Favia joins the princely mission to the UK in September in the presence of Princess, uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Astrid. Hopefully this, makes, uh, this mission can take place, and it, it is also an opportunity here to discuss some remaining issues to be clarified with UK officials. Bavia is organizing several events for the food sector during this mission, so I uh, address a warm invitation to the food companies present to register for this mission. You can do so before the 3rd of May, so don't hesitate. In addition, a feasibility study is ongoing on the provision of a Belgian country page on the web, web shop of the number one online British retailer, Ocado. This can give an extra visibility to our delicious Belgian food and drinks. Food companies can also stimulate this via e-commerce. So and more info on this will uh, follow shortly. Very much uh, obliged for your uh, attention. And um, again, sorry, Bart Beuze wasn't able to attend. Um, and I'm happy to take further questions and Q&A later. Thank you, Didi. Thank you, Tine. Uh, don't worry, I, I think that Bart had a, a very good replacement by you. you uh, it, it was excellent to see not only uh, we all know that those measures of October 2021 and those applying as of uh, 1st of January 2022 will have an impact, but it's great to see that um, uh, Favia uh, is taking up its role as uh, the federation of the sector and is doing everything to, uh, to keep things as smoothly as possible. So I would say keep up the good work and let's hope that this important industry, uh, which um, uh, the food and, and, and beverage industry obviously is in our Belgian exports uh, that you will, uh, you will be able to uh, um, make sure that uh, consequences uh, are as limited as possible. Now, it was already mentioned also by Jeroen uh, from Belgian Customs that uh, not already 750 people called to the helpline and uh, that especially the, the transport sector um, experienced uh, early in January some problems. Uh, now, quite obviously, um, 
with a channel uh, between Belgium and uh, the UK, um, transport is absolutely needed. Um, we, can, we can go through the whole list of industries, but products manufactured in Belgium, they need to get at their destination in the UK. And let that be the sector which was maybe uh, hit the, the most uh, from a practical uh, point of view. And therefore, I'm very glad that we can announce now um, Madame Marie Des uh, de Rousseau uh, from Febitra. Uh, Febitra is the Federation of uh, the Belgian Hauliers and Logistics Service. Uh, Marie de Rousseau uh, has a master's degree in public administration at the Ghent University, and she was already active on an international uh, level uh, early on. Uh, she returned to Belgium now and has become policy advisor for Febitra. And this job combines her interest for policy development as well as her love for transport and logistic, which is apparently a uh, family uh, activity. So, Marie, the floor is fully yours, and um, it will be very interesting to, to see how you can guide us through the, the, the consequences the transport industry has experienced due to Brexit. Thank you very much, Didier. So welcome everyone. Um, before diving into the subject of Brexit, I will briefly discuss our sector. So we'll see if this works. Yes, there we go. So it consists of more than 10,000 enterprises, which are mainly SMEs. Um, another interesting number to underline this aspect, 70% um, of all Belgian holders have on average less than five trucks in their fleet. If you want to compare, the biggest or the largest Belgian holders have more than 400 trucks. So we have enormous differences in our sector, but most of all, um, we are family businesses and SMEs. Even though we are characterized by our compactness, we employ more than 100,000 employees, um, which makes us the fifth largest sector in Belgium based on FTEs. Belgian holders are mainly focusing on uh, national transport. So 62% of all national traffic uh, carried out by Belgian trucks is within our own territory. When looking at international transport, we see that the UK is rather a small part. Um, it makes up 3% for import activities and 1.8% of export activities. Febitra is the Belgian Federation of Hauliers and Logistics Service Providers. We were established in 1946. So this year we are celebrating our 75th anniversary. Um, we're active on various policy levels, local, regional, federal, and international level, where we keep the interests of our members in the hearts and minds of other stakeholders. As already said, I am Marie Derusso. I am a policy advisor for Febitra, and I work on Brexit and COVID. We, as Febitra, have conducted a, a thorough survey in cooperation with our members to gain a better insight on the impact of Brexit uh, these first months. So let's start. 50%, 25% of all Belgian holders who were active the previous years on UK soil has ceased their UK activities in 21. These are mostly micro and small enterprises, and we see no significant impact for international hauliers and hauliers specialized uh, in UK traffic. What is surprising though, is that the impact is felt equally across Belgium. So if you look at all provinces, we see a similar decrease. To be honest, I was a bit surprised um, because in the Walloon region, we see less uh, UK specialized enterprises, so as expected to see a higher decrease there uh, than instead of West Flanders, but apparently it's not the case. Fear and uncertainty has been um, the main drivers 
four stalling activities. And we see three aspects, fear of costs, fear of bureaucracy, and fear of unpreparedness. One, fear of course, costs, it's logic. Um, it, transport takes more hours. Um, you need more personnel, more formalities, and so on. So that's, that's quite a logic one. Two, fear for bureaucracy. Um, as Jeroen already has said, each port, for example, has its own procedure. So holders need to learn all the procedures in every port. So that's, that's quite um, a challenge, challenging step to take. But um, here comes also the uncertainty in play. So we had a rather late Brexit deal. Um, and if there was no deal, holders would need a special permit in order um, enable to be able to operate on the UK. It's called a SEMT permit. Um, the, the application for that permit takes a long time. So holders needed already to ask uh, that permit in September or October. So, um, so that was something. But also using a SEMT permit is quite an administrative burden. It takes a lot of paperwork to prove each traffic. So it's, it's not so hard to believe that uh, many holders were not very enthusiastic uh, to use that permit. So um, luckily there was a deal. Um, and then third, the third factor and preparedness is linked of course with the second one as well. If you want to operate on a third country, there are a lot of more uh, formalities. If you want to fulfill these formalities well, you need to be prepared as a holder, but also as a client. And we see that for some holders who have taken the risks into account, it was not cost efficient anymore to operate on the UK after Brexit. Of course, if 25% of all um, holders are not longer operating on the UK, we see still that three and four is doing transport operations. And there, um, these holders are signaling um, a 50% less a loss of transport activities um, towards the UK. When looking at the median, which is 7.5%, we see that there, we, we we suspect um, outliners uh, on both sides. And um, it's also confirmed by uh, our holders. Um, we have, for example, some uh, holders who are losing, who have lost 90% of their activities. Of course, how can this be ex explained? Therefore, we have to go back to the first slides of, of the presentation. We are an SME uh, sector. So we have a lot of our SMEs who are driving for um, a small but regular number of clients. And of course, if, if one of those clients um, stops their activities on the UK, it's an enormous impact for you as well. And then if we look at the sort of type of goods that are most impacted, there we see two um, areas to say it like that, and that's the automotive, um, but also bulk transport. And of course, it is very interesting to note that facing some consequences of the, the stockpiling in December 2020, um, but also on the one hand, we're seeing that some holders are still waiting to see if they should jump into the Brexit adventure. But on the other hand, um, holders and their clients have also been using this first month as a learning experience um, in order to do better traffic the following months. And we're still in a pandemic. Um, and we see that these numbers are also shaped by the impact of COVID-19. So we, as Febitra, believe that the following six to 12 months, um, we will be able to provide better, better um, numbers and statistics, which will more uh, focus on, on the impact of Brexit and not the impact of Brexit and COVID combined. Operating on the UK has been uh, become more costly, 9.3% to be exact um, for holders of course. We can also see that clients are not paying the full price. Um, they are 
mainly being faced with an 8.2 price increase. And we see that four major factors um, are contributing to the costs. One, unpreparedness of mostly UK clients. Two, administrative personal. Three, customs formalities. And four, waiting hours. When we're talking with our haulers, they are signaling, signaling the most problems when they're operating um, for UK clients, especially um, in the beginning of, of 21. Um, it was quite a burden. Um, just to give an example, we have had truck drivers um, that where the deal was made that the client will do all customs formalities, but they arrived at the loading dock of the UK client and they didn't know if they would receive the customs, for, customs documents at the loading dock itself or should drive to a local uh, customs representative in the neighborhood or would receive their um, documents at the port. So it has been really confusing. And of course, it's not that chaotic everywhere, but we see um, that the, the gap between customs knowledge between European clients and UK clients is significant. What we also see is that this, ha this has led to frustration with truck drivers, um, but also with haulers. And there we see one, um, one consequence, and that's that some, it's, it's a minority, but still some Belgium haulers rather drive empty back to Europe than engage with UK clients. The second factor, administrative personnel, is linked with the first one. If a driver is being faced with a problem, a rather big problem, he or she calls the supportive personnel to, um, to just pass on the information so that the supportive personnel also can uh, search for a solution. So if there are a lot of more problems during these transports, of course, the supportive personnel is also more engaged with the, with the transport and it takes more um, personal hours. Of course, uh, something else is also um, learning time. Um, all of these transport personnel also have to learn uh, customs formalities because it's not something that many of them were used to do. Um, but something else is also monitoring of these um, rides, traffics. Just to give an example of how you can um, see monitoring, um, until two days ago, if you were driving from the UK to Europe via the Eurotunnel or the port of Dover, you needed a Kent access permit. And this permit is only available 24 hours. For transport, which is very flexible, a lot of things can happen. Um, that's a very narrow gap, a very narrow window. So we needed personal to monitor this permit. Um, if if something else happened, that there was still the permit was still in order, so that penalties can be um, can be expelled. Um, then we can go to the. So we're very happy that the Kent access permit has been abolished. Um, a couple of days ago, but still other monitoring effects are still uh, taking place. The third aspect, custom formalities, is a logical one. Um, extra formalities means extra steps within um, the logical chain, so the distance between the, the sender and the client becomes longer, which also means that each interaction between the holder and the client is more expensive. And then we go to the last but not least uh, aspect, waiting hours. In Belgium, we have the most expensive drivers uh, of all Europe. Um, just to, to give, give an example, uh, the waiting hour for uh, the waiting cost for one hour for a Belgian driver is 82 euros, which is gigantic. And if you know that pre-Brexit, um, loading hours, so waiting hours were one and a half. Um, I know after Brexit, waiting hours have become on average seven hours. 
it's very easy to see that each traffic has um, risen its cost significantly. What is also very interesting is to compare um, the impact of transport with average numbers. Important here to note is that these average numbers are um, from the Flemish Chamber of Commerce. Um, they have done a survey with enterprises who um, signaled this uh, statistics. Looking at export, you can see um, a bigger difference. So uh, minus six versus minus 15%, which makes us believe that since the start of Brexit, um, transport activities towards the UK have been taken over um, by less expensive foreign uh, hauliers. But also looking at the costs, we see that the costs are doubled for transport companies instead of for, uh, if you look at, at the average uh, number. So there we can conclude that for these months, to say at least, that transport has been more impacted um, on average than, than other sectors. And of course, we're still in the first months of Brexit. Um, we're still waiting for the introduction of the second and the third phase of the border operating model. Um, Tina has already explained it very good. Um, these second and third phase will require more health certificates, more border checks, which of course um, has a potential to increase the waiting hours. And already seen um, in the following in the previous slides, waiting hours, especially for um, Belgian companies, are not a good thing. So what do we what do we propose? Um, that's a green lane. A green lane is a digital platform and a physical post based in Belgium, where the truck driver can um, arrive and clear all customs formalities. So when he or she receives um, a green certificate that everything is in order. Uh, he or she can start the, the traffic um, without an interruption towards the UK. What is the ultimate goal, of course, is the reduction of border controls and waiting hours. What is needed in order to succeed, that is transparency, transparency and accessibility for all stakeholders. So not only the the truck driver, the importer, the exporter, but also um, custom representatives of Belgium, the Netherlands, France, and the UK. This is a proposal um, done by um, several federations and, and us, of course, and we're still in, in talking with the administration whether this should be um, imposed. Et voilà. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward um, to all your questions and remarks. Thank you, Marie. Uh, well, quite impressed uh, seeing uh, numbers of minus 15%. Of course, there will be some questions later on how that is referred to with um, uh, other um, considerations to be made, uh, such as was there some stockpiling in December? Has this in, influenced the, the situation? But um, also from a cost point of view, seeing that there is a, a raise of 9.3%, which is has, has to be paid for 8.2% uh, by the client, and of course 1.1% also by your sector um, to be taken into account, absolutely. Um, you also touched the fact that there is still a, third, a second and third phase to be uh, to be expected, and this is of course what now brings us to the to the following topic. And I'm I'm very glad that we can count on the help of the Federal Public Service uh, of Economy, who is uh, taking um, a sharp notice uh, of all current but also all possible future negotiations that will be um, um, that will be going on and uh, Ward Minard who's um, uh, a rules of origin and Brexit expert uh, at the Federal Public Service of Economy is going to make the next presentation in this respect um, in his capacity uh, as 
uh, Brexit experts and rules of origin, as we all know, one of the major uh, new documents that had to be provided with. He's responsible for the analysis of the origin chapters of the EU UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement. And therefore, he's providing counsel to senior members of the organization and the ministers, minister responsible for economy. And quite obviously, our minister of economy, together with his European colleagues, uh, needs to be aware of what is on the table, what needs to be done. So, Wart, please uh, take the floor and provide us with your view on what we can expect further. Thank you, TTA, for these uh, kind words of introduction. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen, of course, also on my behalf. Uh, as Idia said, the idea is that I uh, give you today some more insight and an overview of uh, the current and future talks with the UK. Uh, but before I do that, I always find it interesting and insightful for the participants uh, to uh, show you a short recap and to contrast the situation where we are in today with the situation we had uh, beforehand. So before uh, the UK became a, a third country vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. So I would like to start my presentation with a short recap of this situation. Now, very simple here, the slides uh, I've shown here depicts the situation as it was between the Brexit referendum in the UK uh, in June 2016, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, the situation on the 31st of January last year. Uh, so there you have the UK being a full member of the European Union. Uh, and as one might expect in that capacity as a member of the European Union, it has its representatives in the EU decision-making bodies. So for example, the Council of Ministers, the European Commission and the European Parliament. So the UK was really able to directly influence uh, EU decision-making from that capacity. But of course, with power come responsibilities. And there you have it that, uh, of course, the UK also had to, to do something in, in, in return for these uh, powers and in its uh, capacity to influence decision making. And these are the responsibilities every member state has. And this is, for example, I only took two examples, uh, contributing to the EU budget and customs procedures at the EU border. Now, the UK and the EU used the time, uh, those uh, three or four years between the Brexit referendum and the coming into force of the withdrawal agreement on the 21st of January last year uh, to negotiate this agreement. And this agreement uh, contained a principle cons uh, called the uh, transition period because uh, this withdrawal agreement only um, discussed the uh, relationship and the uh, topics related to the UK being a uh, EU member state. And the idea was that during the transition period, so running from the 1st of uh, February last year to the end of uh, last year, 2020, uh, that the UK and the EU would take that time to negotiate a new partnership, a future relationship in the form of a, a trade and cooperation agreement, a TCA or an FTA, a free uh, trade agreement, uh, as you would like. Now, during this period, something very special happens. Uh, the UK no longer formally is a member of the um, EU. So it is no longer a member of the EU decision-making bodies. Like I said, for example, the Council, Commission or Parliament, it does not have its representatives there present anymore, meaning that it cannot directly influence EU decision-making. But on the other hand, uh, you of course have, uh, or the, the UK retained its responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the EU, being, for example, uh, again, uh, a, making a contribution contribution to the EU, uh, EU budget or uh, executing customs formalities at the border when, for example, goods were being traded between the territory of the EU with a third country. So the EU was, uh, the UK, I'm sorry, was still obliged to check uh, those goods going in and out of the EU territory. Now, you could ask yourself the question, uh, this is a bit of a silly situation, what is the gain for the UK here, because uh, they have the responsibilities as a EU, uh, EU member state, but they are no longer a, a formal member, so they can no longer directly influence decision making, what is the gain here? Well, of course, the idea was that during this transition period, the UK and the EU would have almost frictionless trade with each other, and they gained some time to negotiate an FT in record time, I could say, that I think. Now, as I just said before, uh, on uh, Christmas Eve last year, the EU and the UK uh, succeeded in negotiating a free trade agreement, and that is what we, what we will look into in the next couple of slides. Now, then I would like to focus on the uh, present day relationship between the EU and the UK. So this is the relationship we have for the moment uh, as from the 1st of January this year. 
And there you will see that uh, the FDA, uh, the uh, relationship is managed by three broad pillars. I will go into detail uh, later on in my presentation. But first you have the provisional application of the EU UK TCA. I say provisional, why is that? Because the House of Commons already ratified the agreement. I think it was uh, 30 of December uh, last year, but the European Parliament did not yet ratify the agreement. So this means for the moment, uh, if I'm not mistaken, until the end of this month, uh, the FDA um, is provisionally applicated. And uh, the second uh, large pillar, I would say, is the uh, withdrawal agreement, which is still into force, mostly because of the fact that uh, some uh, subjects relating to the UK being a EU member state beforehand uh, still have to be settled. For example, uh, as we all know, the border in Ireland and Northern Ireland, our prime minister uh, uh, referred to it in his, in his uh, introductionary speech. But I will come back to this topic uh, later on. But I think very important to stress here uh, also with regards to, to further talks with the UK is that the FDA, which is currently provisionally in place, as I said, is only one of many talks which are for the moment going on. So we have on the one hand these discussions on trade, uh, provisionally application of the uh, FDA. Uh, but besides these, these stream of negotiations and talks, you also have, for example, negotiations on uh, data flows, personal data, uh, for example, uh, what data can uh, uh, e UK, I'm sorry, UK companies use when when um, uh, um, trading with, with uh, EU customers, for example. Uh, then you have discussions on a memorandum of understanding on financial services. You have, for example, police and judicial cooperation and so on and so on. So as you can see here on my slide, there are quite a few of uh, topics, subjects where besides trade, which is of course very important, but besides this trade subject where you have um, talks with the UK. Now, one thing I forgot to mention here on my slide, or without, which I did not mention on purpose, is um, uh, talks and negotiations on defense and military cooperation. Uh, why is that? Because most of the topics which are included here in this slide, for example, this uh, financial services or uh, data flows, uh, these are all topics which uh, the UK discusses with the EU as an institution. So the member states report their wishes to the EU and the UK uh, and the EU discuss these uh, accordingly. But uh, military and defense cooperation is, uh, as you might know, uh, quite a sensitive uh, topic in uh, European affairs. So this is a topic the UK discusses directly with the member states. So just to, to attend you to it that, uh, or, or um, to, to uh, put your focus on the fact that besides the talks we have on a European level, there are also talks going on on a, a ministerial level, civil service, for example, uh, on more technical uh, things, for example, on military and defense cooperation. And as I said beforehand, uh, important to emphasize here is that the withdrawal agreement is still in force. So this is what I said before. I think you can uh, neatly summarize the current EU-UK relationship in a, a three pillar structure, so to speak. So on the left hand, you have the withdrawal agreement. Uh, I'll call the left hand side the, the, the side of the past, uh, where you have the agreement managing all things related to the UK still being a EU, um, EU member state. Well, beforehand, of course, uh, for example, pension schemes, personal, um, uh, the situation of, of citizens uh, in the two countries, for example, and so on and so on. Uh, then you have the, I think, the, the broadest, most important pillar of the new relationship and the future relationship, which is the EU-UK TC8 on treating, uh, trading goods. And then the third pillar, I think, is uh, more technical issues. For example, like I mentioned, the uh, memorandum of understanding on financial services, data flows, and so on. And to make a clear distinction between the two, I think you can say in, in general that the withdrawal agreement and the TCA uh, are more, uh, well, more binding, have more binding commitments, a more stringent governance structure. I will come back to that later. You will see that there are, for example, committees which have to meet once every so often. Uh, these are things where, where the EU and the UK really have to talk to each other, uh, so to speak. And then you have the more technical issues, which are managed more loosely, so to say, on a lower level, um, more technical details uh, between um, ministries, for example. Uh, this is th These are not the kind of issues where the uh, heads of state and government are involved. Now, as we are uh, speaking today on a webinar on trade, uh, I found it interesting to, to focus now and then on the EU-UK uh, trade and cooperation agreement in detail. And I will show you some aspects of the inter-EU-UK uh, governance of this agreement. 
So as you will uh, immediately notice, I suppose, is the uh, pyramid-shaped form of the TCA's governance structure. Uh, this is, I would say, the, the usual uh, way of governing a, a free, tra uh, free trade agreement, uh, well, at least the uh, use free trade agreements, uh, where you have on the very top of the pyramid the, the leaders' meeting. Uh, the idea is that the heads of state and government, because the UK is such an important partner, uh, meet once every so often to discuss, uh, well, the, the, the broad, uh, some broad guidelines, the implementation of the agreement, and so on. Uh, then one level lower, you have the Partnership Council, which is established by the TCA. Uh, this is a council on uh, the level of the, the ministers. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, for the EU, the representative is uh, Maros Sferovic. He is the uh, Vice Commission President. And uh, from the UK side, you have uh, the Lord uh, David Frost, which are responsible for the more day-to-day follow-up of the agreement. And then you have the, the more technical level, I would say the level where most of the work happens, uh, which is the level of the committees. You have the trade specialized committees for things directly relating to topics which are included in the FTA. And then of course, some specialized committees on a whole plethora of issues, for example, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary uh, measures, fisheries, market taxes, social secu uh, security, I will not repeat my whole slide, but I suppose you get the idea here. So, as I said, this is the more technical level of follow-up. Um, this level is is of consists mainly of uh, representatives of the permanent representation, so the embassies of the member states uh, with the European Union, uh, the UK embassy, and then national exports like myself, for example, for rules of origin, uh, depending, of course, on the topic at hand. And we provide a input to this uh, committee or to the, the presidents of this committee, and this is then further managed within the governance structure of the FTA. And then you have an even uh, lower, I would not say informal level, because as, as it is firmly established by the uh, FTA, but then you have an even lower level of working groups, which you could see as the preparatory groups of these, um, these technical committees uh, of these, these different issues. Now, there is one committee I would like to especially focus on for a few minutes. Uh, I should point to the fact that this is a committee under the withdrawal agreement, so not under the TCA, but I think it is a very important committee of the withdrawal agreement because it is one of the more sensitive topics which are being discussed between the EU and the UK for the moment. And that is the withdrawal agreements a specialized committee on island and northern island protocol. I will not repeat the name, don't worry. Uh, but this is the committee which is responsible for governing, well, the special situation we have for the moment in Northern Ireland. Uh, as you might know, in the withdrawal agreement, there were sp some uh, special provisions uh, which allowed Northern Ireland to become, well, uh, let's say, for a part uh, part of the UK for some matters and for uh, for another part, uh, a part of the uh, internal market of the EU, um, which had as a consequence that there was no border on the Isle of Ireland, but there was a border in the Irish Sea, so between the Isle of Ireland and Great Britain, the, the, the large island next to it. Now, for the moment, as you might have seen in the news, there are a few uh, holdups in discussions between the EU and the UK. One is that, uh, for the moment, um, the building of border posts, so customs border posts in Northern Ireland, uh, to execute these checks on goods coming from uh, Great Britain, uh, is delayed. Well, I would say delayed uh, for quite a few years. This is due to the troubles. So, um, apparently, some uh, European civil servants working in Northern Ireland uh, received uh, death threats. And then, second problem is that you had uh, recently the unilateral extension of the so called grace period for checks by the UK on goods coming from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. Uh, why is this a problem? Because, well, if you have an island, this is an enclosed environment. If you send uh, goods from one island or for Europe, for example, to the island, you have, well, breached the barrier, so to speak. So, in principle, you have to um, have sanitary and phytosanitary checks at the border. And there was a grace period in place until the end of uh, March, if I'm not mistaken, but the UK uh, unilaterally extended this period because of uh, well, customs formalities and problems for supermarkets to get um, to get refilled. Um, to uh, I think it was the end of October. So these were things which were unacceptable to the EU, and now an infringement procedure has been started by the EU, which is a consultation process with the UK to discuss the possibilities to come to a mutual solution.
Why is this so important? Why do I um, point to this uh, committee in special? Because I think, well, uh, besides all the talks we have ongoing on the topics I've mentioned before, the TCA, which is being implemented provisionally, well, this uh, committee for the moment has a direct impact on the relationship between the two uh, countries, between the two um, groups, so to speak, the two, the two parties, because of the fact that uh, while the UK does not fully um, uh, execute the, the withdrawal agreement as foreseen, the European Parliament decided to postpone its vote on the uh, TCA implementation, which is of course very important because if there is no vote because, uh, before the end of the provisional application, we face a new cliffhedge scenario. Uh, now, I thought it would be insightful for you to give you a short overview and insight in the intra-EU governance of the agreement, uh, so that you could see how the EU and, um, by extension, Belgium manages the uh, talks with the UK under this, uh, under this agreement. Uh, and there you will again immediately see that the relationship with the UK is uh, quite a bit of a particularity, so to say, because normally most of the EU's FTAs, for example, with Canada, Japan, South Korea, certainly the modern era FTAs, are managed by the Council's, so the Council of Ministers uh, Trade Policy Committee. Uh, but this is not the case for the UK. Uh, as the EU says, we have a special relationship with the UK, which you could read as being a large economy next door, so very influential. And the question is being raised uh, within uh, the European structures, decision making structures, whether a separate uh, governance structure is necessary. Well, there is one for the moment. You have the uh, Trade Policy Committee for all the other FTAs, and then on the other hand, the Working Party on the UK, which follows up on everything related to Brexit. And the question is, but it is an open question, these discussions are still ongoing, whether the working party on the UK needs to provide the, for the follow-up of the, the agreement once it is uh, well uh, ratified by both parties. Uh, but this is something which is still under discussion. And then maybe two sentences on the Belgian governance of the agreement. So the coordination of the agreement is uh, done by our colleagues of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And they collect all the input, the export input by uh, the relevant uh, other ministries, for example, could be myself or, or my colleagues uh, for uh, in economic subjects. And of course, also the, the regions for Anders Wallonia, the Brussels region, depending on the subject at that hand. So we provide our expert input to the colleagues of the of foreign affairs, which defend the Belgian point of view in the um, meetings of the policy committee or the working party on the UK. Now, if we then look into more detail about the future EU-UK talks, well, here I've made a very general slide. Why is that? Because I think besides the things I already said, the agreements which are uh, being provisionally applicated and the withdrawal agreement, which is already in force, it is very hard to assess and uh, estimate for the moment uh, what the future will hold. Uh, but one thing I think we can be sure of is that the new relationship between the UK and the EU will be one, ever evolving, and two, it will not be carved in stone. Well, it means more or less the same. Uh, but what I mean by that is that, well, depending on the subject at hand, and given the fact that the UK is a very large neighbor next door, as the UK puts it, uh, and the EU puts it, we have a special relationship with each other. I think it is important to be to be flexible and to, uh, well, uh, have uh, regular talks and have uh, governance structures uh, adapted and depending on the subject at hand. Uh, for example, if you have uh, talks on uh, aviation safety uh, legislation, for example, a very technical topic, as long as you have an agreement on these uh, legislations, on these uh, on these topics, it is not necessary, I think, to to meet uh, once every every year, for example, or once every uh, every few weeks. At the other hand, uh, I think Jeroen will will agree with me. If you have uh, problems at the border because of uh, customs affairs, for example, I think more regular meetings would be would be necessary. So. These are, these are all things which are not yet, or for the most part, not yet crystal clear. Uh, one thing I think we can be sure of is that the relationship will be one, intense, and two, uh, will be, well, uh, how to say, a bit um, uh, raffled out, depending on the topic, you will have uh, quite a few different kinds of, of relationships, intensity of the relationship, and so on and so on. But I think for both parties, it's, it would be very interesting to, to um, remain uh, in a close partnership. Now, we can, however, make an educated guess on the future relationship uh, based on, uh, as I said before, the, the talks we are moment, uh, for the momently having uh, on the EU-UK TCA. 
And that is because if you would uh, read the TCA in detail, but I uh, dissuade you from it because it's a uh, quite a long text, uh, you would see that the TCA contains uh, quite a few review clauses and for example, uh, contains arbitration panels. Now, what does this mean is that uh, once every so often you have a general a global review of the um, a TCA, uh, which will be led by the various committees I um, mentioned before. So depending on the subject, every committee will look at the texts of the agreement at hand and uh, will check whether there are uh, several changes needed and report them to the partnership uh, council. The same goes for the arbitration panels. Were there to be discussions or problems between the EU and the UK in the implementation of the agreement, then you would be needing these arbiters to discuss uh, a solution and to propose a solution to one or both parties or even um, um, sanction one or both depending on the on the problems which are at hand at that time. Now the agreement provides us with a general structure of review which is that uh, five years after, uh, after the entry into force of the agreement and every five years thereafter uh, we will see a global review of the agreement which basically means uh, like I mentioned that every committee goes into detail uh, about the text it, it's responsible for reports to the partnership council and small changes can be made to the agreement so at least for the coming years the EU and the UK are obliged to talk to each other uh, be in an intense relationship to manage this agreement and well I suppose after the ratification hopefully by the end of this month uh, the kickoff of these committees will be given uh, somewhere in 2021 the calendar is already being uh, distributed uh, in principle all these committees meet for the first time in uh, 2021 somewhere now, as I said before, uh, the committees are responsible for the follow-up of the agreements uh, dedicated to them. And uh, here under the chapters as well, you will have, besides the regular review of the, the complete agreements, uh, you will have, uh, well, uh, how to say, um, uh, shorter follow-up talks, so more intensive talks uh, depending on uh, the topics. And I only took three of them to give you an, uh, an overview of um, of uh, the, the way this happens. Uh, for example, for fisheries, uh, the negotiators, uh, both the UK and the EU, decided that there will be an agreement on quotas until 2026. And thereafter, we will have yearly negotiations from 2027 uh, onwards. So this means basically that you would have a, um, a very intense relationship, a very intense partnership uh, talks from 2027 onwards to yearly discuss these uh, quotas. The same goes for energy, and uh, which is more my topic, rules of origin, uh, for example. The rules are quite fixed, but uh, on duty drawback, for example, there could be a review uh, starting from 2023. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, there are quite a few topics um, which we need to juggle in the air all together for the moment. Uh, I suppose the relationship uh, current and future with the UK will be an intense one, but I can only conclude by saying that I think it is very important for both parties that it is the case and that we will be stronger together if we negotiate and, and uh, well, try to defend our interests on a global uh, forum uh, together. So thank you for your attention. I am uh, very open to queries you might have, and I uh, gladly pass the floor to uh, DTA or to Madame Loos for the uh, proceeding of this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Wart, and uh, thank you for the swift and, and, and very well-structured and clear um, explanation of where we are standing, where we're coming from, where we are standing now, and what we might expect for the near future. Um, what I, I can make, instead of going immediately to the closing of the event, we still have some time so we can address uh, some of the questions. Um, there were a number of them uh, uh, popping in. Uh, we will not be able to, to answer them all, of course. Um, but um, I might as well stick with you because one of the questions that regularly uh, came back, um, of course, Belgium is also a very important services country and the export Indeed. Is, uh, has its importance in the Belgian economy, quite obviously. Um, a lot of people, uh, we're talking about FinTech for, uh, for example, but uh, a number of people ask, where are we standing now with, um, uh, with the, 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 the trade in services uh, between the UK and Europe. Uh, are you in a position to, to, to comment on that? 
Well, I can say some things. I'm I'm not aware of the the talks in uh, in, in detail because uh, of the fact that this is followed but mostly by the colleagues of of uh, the of Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, but I do know one thing, and that is that uh, talks are going on depending on the subjects. Uh, mostly, services is not being discussed between the EU and the UK as as a whole. Uh, the focus is on well uh, specific services, for example, telecommunications, financial services, and so on. Uh, but these talks are going on. But uh, this goes quite quite slowly the main one of the main problems is that uh, on services well you have no real cross border physical cross border trade uh, but the problem there is that you have to um, have um, how to say in english um, uh, well mutual consent mutual uh, rules in application uh, so to make sure that uh, when you provide a service here uh, someone in in the uk for example can enforce its its uh, rights and regulations and this is quite of a sensitive topic between the eu and the UK because of the simple fact that, well, the UK exits from the EU uh, just to be able to, uh, well, uh, form and 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 um, uh, decide on its own rules. So it is very important to know for the both parties if we allow one service provider to uh, establish its service here in, in our country in, or in our region uh, to make sure that uh, both parties retain their, their rights. So these dogs are going on, but this goes very slowly and it is quite of a sensitive point. So I, I do not expect great Great truths the, the coming weeks, but I suppose we can so expect something later this year on, on several topics. Clear. Thanks a lot, Ward. Uh, maybe a question uh, for uh, for Jeroen. Uh, a number of people are wondering, uh, especially when they were uh, transporting goods uh, into the UK um, in December and, and did a little bit of stockpiling. Now they see that the whole of the stock cannot be sold uh, on, the, on the UK market. And some questions arise, uh, what is the status of, of those goods? Can they be brought back uh, in a quite an easy way or will there be problems at the border when bringing back those goods back into the, uh, the European Union? Well, yes, uh, DJ. There is a, the, um, uh, there is a legal framework called uh, return returning goods. It's um, we have put a text on it on our uh, on our website. Um, but the main thing is, you will be able you you must prove that these goods uh, were originally um, EU goods, so EU twenty seven goods, so, so to speak. Um, and that these exact same goods are uh, are returning. So uh, therefore, we, um, we, um, we 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 gave the um, the advice uh, for people who already anticipated ahead of uh, Brexit that they um, they could draw up an T two L document which proves the uh, the union status. But of course, if you don't have any records. Uh, of how and when those goods left uh, left Belgium for the UK, this will be uh, will be quite difficult. It's actually easier now after Brexit to to use returning goods than if you had goods there um, before the the, um, the the Brexit date itself. Yep. Clearly. Um, so what I what I would suggest to people uh, still confronted with those problems and if they have difficulties that they are they available to contact you or uh, to find out what, what is still possible, what they can do or. Uh... Uh, I, I would just uh, if you ask me, uh, I'll just repeat what's on the, the website, it, uh, our website itself Obviously. and for the practical um, the practical uh, side of things. Um, they should contact the customs broker, uh, customs specialists. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Tina, you received some questions over the chat and I, I think I, I do not have a specific question for you, but you, you had some information uh, that you have been uh, sharing. Maybe it's a, it's a good idea, the two questions that you received and... Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Didier. I already sent the answers directly to uh, the people who asked the questions. I, I did it wrong okay. the first time to the panelists, but uh, in the meantime, the people received an answer by uh, the chat. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. And then, Marie, I, I will close the Q&A with you. Um, this is due to a lack of time. So all other questions, do not worry. We will, uh, we will forward them to the relevant persons and you will be receive an answer uh, in written. Um, but a question that we received for Marie uh, in specific was, uh, well, of course, the transport sector is so important. Everybody needs it. Um, we saw the sharp decline uh, from a Belgian point of view with, with 15%. A lot of people were wondering uh, what is the, uh, the the impact of the, the stockpiling in December. Uh, for so, what is the reference period to uh, to come up with uh, a decline of fifteen percent? And do you see some gradually uh, going up to the the, the average of six percent that you were talking about, or is this this fifteen percent quite steady at uh, at this moment? Oh, indeed. Um, 2019 has been a COVID year, so it's not the good reference uh, to just base our numbers on. So we have taken the numbers of 2018 and 2019 into account. So of course, um, COVID-19 and the stockpiling are um, having an impact on these numbers, but that's not something that we can work it out now. Um, Looking at the 15% decrease, um, that's on average. And as I already said, the 7.5 is the, the median um, because there are enormous outliners. Do I believe that we are facing more 7.5 decrease in the future? That's something that I'm hesitant to say, to be honest. Um, I think we should wait for the following months um, because one of the biggest reasons for decline I see over, over here is, um, is our, our, our cost as a Belgian hauler. Of course, we, we, our cost has been risen a lot. And there we have to see if um, companies are still willing to participate with us or um, are tempted to work with foreign hauliers. Very clear. Thank you very much, Marie. This brings us to the to the closing of, of this webinar. I uh, I would like to thank each and every attendee. I would like to thank you also for for being so uh, interactive uh, throughout the chat and the Q and A uh, possibility uh, of the, the Zoom tool. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Um, I think it, it it was quite interesting, and I think we I might say that we. We can be proud, not only as, as the Belgian Foreign Trade Agency, together with its in institutional partners, um, the Federal Public Service, Foreign Affairs, uh, Flanders Investment and Trade, AWEX and Hub Brussels, but um, we're proud that we were one of the first European countries that could come up with uh, uh, real results and, and real data. Um, that's always a good thing, and it shows that despite that we we are described from time to time as quite a complicated country, that uh, uh, the, the the interaction and the cooperation uh, between the various uh, public services um, can take place in in good order and can be very productive and and results directed. Um, I especially thank the uh, SPF um, finances. Uh, General Administration of Customs and Excises and the Federal Public Service of Economy uh, for their contributions. And of course, I need to thank all those involved, uh, also the federations and the people within our organizations to have brought this to a good end. Um, just to let you know, all of the uh, presentations will be published on um, uh, LinkedIn, where and there will be a link on our website where you can download uh, the, the presentations. Uh, you can also uh, take a look at this webinar again if you want to, uh, to be recalled of one or the other point that draw your attention and you are not uh, completely sure anymore how it went. Uh, there is a possibility to, uh, to review the webinar uh, also on our website. A link will also be sent through LinkedIn. Uh, rest me to thank you for your patience and your uh, numerous uh, attendance and uh, looking forward to, um, to meet you again uh, in a next Trade for You webinar of the Belgian Foreign Trade Agency. Thank you very much and uh, I hope that with the good weekend uh, and the good weather ahead, you can enjoy it. Thank you. Bye-bye.